So welcome everybody to another Deep Adaptation Q&A with myself, Professor Jem Bendel, the founder of the Deep Adaptation Forum. Uh, and this month joining us is Sister Jayanti, uh, who's the European Director of the Brahma Kumari, which is a, a, a spiritual mo movement globally that started uh, in the Indian subcontinent. Um, Sister Jayanti has been working with them as a spiritual teacher and also as someone who engages politicians and the United Nations system on their behalf, uh, doing that for about 50 years. So it's wonderful that um, uh, Sister Jayanti is joining us now from Rajasthan in India. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Om Shanti, a greeting of peace to you, Jem, and all our viewers and listeners. Thank you. And um, I say I'm really grateful that you're able to still join us because obviously it's been quite a, a momentous few weeks. Uh, so the, um, the leader of the Brahma Kumari, Daddy Janki, has just passed, aged 104. Uh, yeah. And so I, was, I'm, I presume there must be quite a lot of uh, reflection and celebration on, uh, about her. I was wondering, just to begin with, what are your memories of her that, that really feel important uh, for you at this, this time? Because, I mean, uh, it's, it's such a worrying time globally, what with the COVID pan pandemic and it's so uncertain. Mm. Um, she was a giant of a person, even though she was four feet 11, um, but her personality was just amazing, radiant. And um, I'd known her for about 62 years of my life. And so that's most of my life that I knew her and lived with her for 40 years. And she would always say, don't think. <laughs> And that's an interesting comment to make. <laughs> and what she would mean is that keep your mind very peaceful and quiet, and then the right thoughts will come. If you let your mind go whirring around in a spin, then you won't be able to see or understand clearly what's going on, and things will get muddled and jumbled and confused. And so here was a woman who had spent a lifetime going deep into herself to explore what is inside our own inner world, thoughts and feelings and conscience and consciousness and how to be able to purify the mind, to have nothing but clean thoughts, noble thoughts, elevated thoughts. And so this in summary is Daddy, and she had been a world server. She's been serving all her life right until the very end. Mm, that's lovely. I, I didn't know she had said don't think. Uh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's perfect because oh, there's a lot of thinking right now about um, yeah, not just to make meaning of of what's happening or to try and um, reduce the vulnerability we face, but also it's almost like people want to um, narrate what does this mean for the future and what comes next, um, mm -hmm. and there's some anxiety in in all of that. And um, I found myself drawn into that. So it's, mm. it's a lovely message for me. Thank you. <laughs> I, I felt that Indeed. would be the most appropriate thing that she would be saying at this moment. I love just, it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just let oh, your mind okay. be peaceful and calm mm. so that then you can even know what to think. Otherwise, okay. there's too much information, misinformation, all sorts of things are happening and yes. you can't think clearly. And so creating space in here is very, very important. And if I can do that, then my own inner inspiration will be guiding me in the right way. And my connection with the one above is going to be clear and strong, and I'll be able to take that guidance also. Hmm. So there is a lot of anxiety. Um, both where you're based in, in the UK, but also now in India. And, um, and then even the, the policies that are taken to try and reduce the risk then obviously have further consequences with more anxiety, more suffering. So yeah. I, I know I was looking back at some of your, your interviews and teachings and that you've said the power of love can be a protection and that when we feel anxious about what's happening in society, we can connect with that feeling, back to that feeling of love and, and act from that place. And I think that's also when you, yeah. you're saying about stilling the mind and allowing yeah. that, that reconnection. I was wondering, as 
not just with the pandemic, but also with the anxieties around climate change and the anxieties around the direct impacts on climate right now in terms of on harvests and livelihoods and so on. What can you say about that? Um, how do we go about connecting to that power of love? Um, my experience and my understanding both together tell me that the natural state of the human spirit is of love and compassion. And when we lose touch with ourselves because we're so occupied with all the externals of life and lockdown has meant that some of those distractions have been removed from our life. And so it's given us a bit of space, but of course it's all the other things inside ourselves that come up. But if I can connect with the deeper inside, the being that I am within, then in that awareness, there is pure love and there is compassion. And so if we see lockdown as an opportunity, not as a punishment, but as an opportunity to be able to go within, I can feel that love that's there within me and allow it to emerge and be expressed. But it's not your romantic love of candlelights and things, but it's a love which is all embracing and all inclusive so that I see you as my brother and I see mm. every person of the human family as my family. And when there's this interconnectedness that I feel, and that pure love is going to stimulate me to be able to go beyond my own selfish desires and I want, I need, to something which is much higher. Then I can see how we can all of us cooperate together and carry the whole of humanity forward to the next step of our evolution. And I offer a ray of hope. Not just a little ray, but in fact, I, I sense that what's happening now is a very dark period. And in India, they would describe it as the Iron Age. And beyond that, the darkness comes the day, the light. And that we would say is this transition period, and there's a huge amount of upheaval on all levels inside ourselves and externally also. Uh, nationally and internationally upheaval everywhere but it starts from ins inside but mm. if we deal with the dark forces the negativity within ourselves and allow the goodness to be expressed then together we can create a better world for all of us yeah i'd like to to come back to that but also i'm really interested in this um the inner upheavals um as people begin to see that the future won't be what they thought, um, perhaps their their income and their job isn't what they thought, and um, uh, and new fears as well that uh, arise. Um, I was wondering, meditation is is offered uh, by the Brahma Kumaris and indeed with many many spiritual traditions uh, as a as a way of settling those thoughts, connecting to that sense of universal love that you've described and um, connecting some, or aligning one's own will to some divine will. I, I was wondering if you could say something more about meditation because um, some people see it as, and some people offer it as a way of perhaps turning away from the pain and suffering of the world rather than um, finding a way of being more calmly with and engaged with the pain and suffering of the world and calmly with the pain and suffering that we feel inside as we, we, we things seem uncertain. I was wondering if you could say how, how you see meditation, given the fact that so many people have all these different ideas about it. Mm. It's become a spiritual supermarket <laughs> mm. and you can pick up the shelf what it is you, you're looking for maybe. But um, the meditation I practice is Raj Yoga meditation. And the word yoga means union, connection. And what we're talking about here is the awareness, the identity of the self as the inner being and through my thoughts, connecting with the divine so that yoga, that union, connection happens, and I experience that relationship. And 
what's normally happening is that the mind is functioning and it's nonstop through the day, through the night, just usually very, very fast. And in meditation, what we're doing is learning to have mastery over our thoughts so that we're able to slow down the mind. And it happens in a very natural way. If you start that inner journey and look at your thoughts, your thoughts generally then tend to slow down. And then you can select the thought that you want to focus on. Maybe the thought of peace, maybe the thought of love. And you connect with your own inner goodness. Um, I know that I carry a mixture of good and things that are not so good at the moment. And I can deal with the things that are not so good a bit later on. But at this moment, let me focus on that inner goodness that lies in every, absolutely every human being. So I'm connecting with that purity, that peace. And in that higher consciousness, I can be aware of the presence of the divine. When I'm struggling with my jealousy, my envy, my fear, all of these things, I'm very far away from that level of consciousness in which I can be aware of the presence. But when I clear my mind and learn to focus on the goodness within, then in that way, I'm raising my consciousness, my energy, and I'm able to feel the presence of the divine. And with my thoughts, I make contact. So it's not stopping thoughts. It's not saying, go into silence, make your mind go blank. Um, externally, I'm not speaking. But internally, I'm now beginning to have a conversation with the divine. And so yeah. there's a relationship that I'm building up. And that means I'm getting two things. I'm getting the additional love, peace, and strength that I need. But I'm also receiving the power I need to deal with all the human frailties that we all have that keep holding us back, our egos, our anger, all of this. And mm. so that means that I'm actually preparing myself to engage more fully with other individuals, but also with the world at large. Um, so it's not a meditation that leads to escapism or denial, but rather it's a preparation to be able to engage more fully with the highest that there can be within myself. So that now, instead of always being one who is needy and wanting and taking, and I'm not talking about money and food, I'm talking about the inner um, thirst of the soul. I need love, I need this, I need happiness. And so I'm wanting somebody or something to provide me with that. But now, in that higher awareness in which I've been able to fill myself, I can actually start giving. And so that changes the dynamic of the relationships I have around me very, very quickly. But yes. it also widens my horizon so that my family is not just my limited nuclear family or in a community to which I belong, but truly I'm able to go above those limitations and see the family of humanity as my family. Mm. I belong to this bigger family. I, it's only, thank you for that. Um, it's, it, it's only since um, I started practicing meditation more fully um, about a year ago, and particularly doing a Vipassana insight meditation, that the, that the power of it became clear to me. Previously, I thought it was about just uh, calming the breathing, slowing the thoughts, um, and then therefore somehow just being a bit more relaxed. Um, but actually then I realized it's, it's brought this awareness of, of sort of thoughts and feelings, emotions, sensations happening to me rather than defining me. And therefore I can watch them a bit more. And so for example, in the past month at different times, I felt a bit panicked. Uh, about the situation living here in Indonesia um, and not being able to leave Indonesia now. And, and yeah, I realized that that 
ability to watch what's happening in my body and not act from it to 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 not act from that that in, immediate fear um it is something which i've gained and i can i have even if i'm not meditating it actually just sort of stays with me every day i know with brahma kumara you meditate with your eyes open is it something to do with how you try and then bring it into everyday life you hit it on the nail because say for example now as i see you and we engage together if i'm seeing you as that inner being that light that shines within um our connection is a very different one than it would be you're the professor and i'm the one without any science background without any of this education um there would be all sorts of tensions in our relationship but as it is you're a meditator and i am too and we're connecting soul to soul and so there's a very easy and natural rapport um i mean we met for a couple of hours a year ago and we haven't met since but it's a very natural and easy connection and that's because of this open eyes meditation i think because if i close my eyes in meditation it might be easier temporarily but i'll open my eyes and i'll get distracted and my consciousness from being up there is going to come crashing down right. here mm. but if i can train myself to see and not be distracted keep my thoughts on a higher level then i continue with my action my responsibilities we call it karma yoga action and yoga together yoga in action or action right. in the higher consciousness so then i can engage in speaking eating walking driving whatever it is but it will be with that awareness of being able to see the soul brilliant and, thank you and it can change the world if there's a recipe for changing the world i think it could be this right so i'm i'm really interested because um I think you you live in community both in London but also now where you are at the the base of Mount Abu and there's a benefit from that in terms of lockdown but I perhaps there's also <laughs> a sense of increased vulnerability because of possibilities of transmission I'm wondering so many of us are are feeling vulnerable to infection disease and so on I was wondering how your perspective on the true nature of yourself influences how you feel about your own vulnerability your own sense of mortality i think uh, in the brahma kumaris you talk about soul consciousness and the soul identity i was wondering if you could tell us a bit about that um thank you and yes it's absolutely a fact that if i'm aware of my own inner identity as that being within and you talked about the mastery of thoughts and feelings well it extends also to mastery of my physical senses and so i learn i learn more and more that it's i the soul that lives here um not on the skin but deep inside um i am that inner being in charge of this physical body and my thoughts and feelings are going to impact what's going on in this body we are more used to experiencing it the other way um i hurt my finger i feel the pain and it really shifts my attitude to somebody who caused me that pain maybe my finger got stuck in the door because you slammed it something like that and i'll blame you and this pain is impacting the way i now see you and so usually the body is in influencing the soul and i spoke about a very little thing but in big ways also our thoughts and feelings get impacted by whatever it is our body is going through and now we're reversing the process we're ensuring that the soul takes charge of the body which means that if i can be filled with faith and love and hope even my immunity is enhanced that is a fact it's not just spiritual stuff but mm. it's been proven to be so when there's hope in the heart the immunity goes up and when there's fear then the immunity goes down negativity is going to bring my immunity down mm. so at this particular time 
having this awareness of the inner being means A, I'm keeping my immunity level high, but also I'm very, very aware that the quality of my thoughts is going to make me feel better if I'm sick. It's my thoughts that are going to make me feel better more quickly, but also if, my, if I'm not sick, but I'm not afraid, that's going to be protection in itself anyway. And so I think it's a time when people are recognizing that apart from washing your hands and maintaining social distance and all of those things, the way we think, the way we feel is going to help us stay well or it's going to allow us to succumb to viruses. Or even if the body is fragile and the virus has come, I'll be able to recover more quickly if I have the right thoughts and the attitude and perception of what's going on. Yes, I've come across quite a lot of uh, news and studies around how um, well, the, the connection between uh, mind and body in terms of immunity uh, yeah. uh, and including even altruistic feelings and the yeah. uh, uh, power of one's immune system. Obviously, some of those messages, some of, those, uh, that, some of that evidence and some of that philosophy can, can sometimes be taken out of context um, mm. and lead to some strange sort of um, you know, you got <laughs> ill because you got ill because you worried too much type of stuff. So <laughs> it can be misused, perhaps. But I'm interested in your next. You mentioned hope. If you have hope in the heart, now hope is a concept which is in. It means different things in different spiritual traditions. It even means very different things within Christianity. If you compare different different bits of different debates within Catholicism or within Protestantism, yeah. and. Um, so my understanding of, of hope in relation to soul doesn't really mean much in terms of a hope for my own uh, future in this body. And therefore, by extension, doesn't mean too much really in terms of a hope for how societies will be. My, my, in the sense that um, the hope is more about... Um, how we will be, how I will be, how people I interact with can be, no matter what's happening, whether it's um, an asteroid hitting us from outer space or um, a virus sweeping the world that we can't control or climate change becoming a runaway phenomenon. So I was wondering how you talk about hope. Um, is it a hope for the soul's journey or is it, is it a hope more um, made manifest in the material plane? And and uh, yeah, I'd be very pleased to hear you. <laughs> um, the whole drama of this world in which we are living in, and it's a stage, people come, people go, people play their roles on the stage. And so it's the interaction of soul and matter. It's never that the soul is there on its own, but it's in matter and in the body playing its role on the stage. So yes, I'm talking about hope that the soul is going to feel strong and bright and beautiful and it's going to come to that original state of joy and love that I used to know at some point and now it's again possible for me to return to that. But it's mm. also very much connected with the physical dimension. That yes, there's a time when there's darkness and there's a time when there's light. And we gone through the period of darkness and what we're approaching now is a world of light. And so, yes, we're seeing huge upheaval, but beyond that upheaval, we see that the world will be a better place and human beings will be experiencing their own higher state and they'll be sharing those qualities with each other so that yeah. when people interact, it'll be with kindness and love. When people speak, it'll be words that are supportive and loving and encouraging instead of the harshness that's happening today in the world. So I'm, I'm really interested in this because um, obviously when the Brahma Kumaris were founded uh, and the founder, Dada Lekaraj, in 1937, he had that great vision of suffering with war, with natural and technological disasters. And so that 
um, sense of sort of um, future cataclysm, which is in many spiritual traditions as well, um, that sense of apocalypse and rebirth, but rebirth in different traditions means different things. It could be non-material. It might not be for, for humanity, but for consciousness um, here or in another part of the cosmos. But the Brahma Kumaris, you've, you've had this in your cosmology, in your, in your religious stories and outlook since the beginning. I was wondering what we could learn from that in, as, the, as many people on this planet are waking up to multiple crises which may be uh, irresolvable, at least things may get much, much worse. Uh, there may be huge death and suffering and there's uncertainty about how we get through it or what comes next. Um, what could people waking up to that predicament learn from how the Brahma Kumaris have lived with this um, uh, expectation of a form of, of, of collapse of the Iron Age? Um, we've always kept that vision of a better world in front of us. But also more than that, what we've done is make sure that living in the world, we don't get trapped by the possessiveness and the attachments that are connected with this world. And so that's been a very, very important part of the whole story. Um, if I get mm. attached to even a little thing, that's going to distract me and pull my attention and energy towards itself. But if I can here in a human form, know that this is a fantastic instrument. This body of mine is very precious, but I also know that I have to be the one that's detached from that limited consciousness that the body imposes on me, because this is what leads to when I think I'm Janthi, I'm so-and-so, I am this, 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 and this. There's a whole big trap that I'm falling into. Yes, um, so I, yes. That's, that sounds right for, 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 for me as well. The, the letting go, the incredible letting go of realizing that life as we know it right now is not as it always will be. Um, and I think that, that, that creates as some distance um, which allows, allowed me to really think, well, what do I most value? Uh, mm. Rather than just live from habit and from sort of yeah. my, my acculturation in this society. Yeah. Um, mm. And in that, in that state, when I'm in that limited consciousness of this identity, then the color of my skin, the gender, the age, um, the possessiveness of relationships, the position I hold in society, the tradition I'm supposed to follow, all of these things are really a cage in which I put right. myself into. And connected with all those limitations is also um, the ego, the anger, the greed, the materialism that we are seeing currently. And so all of these things are the traps and spirituality teaches us to go out of that trap and be free. And so when I can be free in the awareness of spirit, I am here in the body, but now this isn't master. I am the master and so I use this in the best possible way can my mind be filled with pure noble elevated thoughts altruistic thoughts that you shared earlier can I make sure that my heart isn't tiny and concerned only for I and me that my heart can be open and big and generous and compassionate can my hands be ones that can give and heal and share with us so I'm using this physical body, but now I'm using it in a very conscious way instead of being just in the past um, bondage of habit because this is what others are doing. This is what I have to do also, and I have to compete with them. And in that competition, of course, sometimes there's also conflict that arises. And so can mm. I go out of all of these things to that higher state of awareness, um, which is the original human state, the love, the peace, the truth. Now, can I go back to that? And the more I maintain that awareness of the inner being, 
the easier it becomes to access these qualities which are there within me. And of course, when I think about hope, for example, I'm thinking about the one up above who's always, always benevolent. And then I begin to see that life is also benevolent. There are things that I go through which are not comfortable, not pleasant, but there are lessons that I have to learn from all of these things to be able to come to that understanding of what is the benevolence of all of this. Um, you mentioned people having the possibility and the time of thinking more deeply about what's going on. So I see that this is the silver lining of COVID-19. Mm, I <laughs> see. Giving us that opportunity. Yeah. I, I have a couple more questions, but also just want to tell uh, the people who are joining us from the Deep Adaptation Forum, uh, please do now start sharing your questions in the chat box, um, uh, especially, of course, if, if you are on video, so we can invite you in in, in, in a few minutes. Um, Sister Jayanti, the Brahma Kumari is the world's largest spiritual organization run by women, and leadership by women has been central, uh, central part of your organization and how it functions. I was wondering, what do you think other religions could learn about women's <laughs> leadership? Um, or even, even actually, because deep adaptation now is becoming a, a movement um, of sorts. And what, what we could perhaps learn is we, we, we have a forum, we, we're organizing things. Uh, what could we learn in terms of why leadership from women is really important? <laughs> I think women have more awareness of what it is to nurture and sustain and so sustainability is a big word but a natural feature of women is that ability to nurture and sustain and so when the founder wanted women to take on this role that was part of the thinking yes it was also that women should be given their equal right in society so that there's balance in the future in society so i would recommend definitely that within your own leadership that you make sure that you have women who have that innate sense of sustainability and nurture, but also, of course, um, they bring a situation in which they're not just thinking ever for themselves alone. They are always thinking of others around them. And so that spirit of service is, again, inborn within women. And it's a, maybe I should say, um, it's a feminine aspect that, men can also have and develop within themselves. But I think that that's another part of it, thinking about the collective, thinking about the whole, mm. thinking about the people rather than just the facts and figures of um, money and finance and logistics, but to be able to have that right side brain come in. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I do find that um, I... I can sometimes accidentally get into squabbles with uh, other men of my age or older about uh, who's more right. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't really seem to have those uh, squabbles uh, with, with women. And so, yes, perhaps there is, it's not just to do with logistics and money. It's to do with sort of categorizing, labeling, defining uh, as part of this desire to have agency and control and oversight, perhaps. And, um, and the... Uh, the spiritual dimension, the, the all, um, is somewhat ineffable or actually ultimately unknowable. And so that kind of whole process of trying to label, describe is, mm. is, 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 is somewhat futile, even though interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm, um, I want to ask you about, oh, sorry, yes. I was just going to say that control and power games have determined the whole period of the last thousand years and have created wars and conflict. And so it's time to get away from just that mm. external side of power and control and know that um, spiritual power is the power of love, is the power mm. of compassion. Yeah, definitely. And um, I want to ask you about some lifestyle choices because it's been coming up in debates about, about, um, if you're concerned about climate change, whether it's cutting carbon emissions or drawing them down or just preparing for ongoing disruption to our lives, and um, which is more what Deep Adaptation Forum and Movement are about. Um, 
people talk about diet. And I, I think most Brahma Kumaris are vegetarians. Um, so I was wondering, could you explain why do you choose the vegetarian life, um, including from a spiritual perspective? And um, so that I think that would be really helpful for, for people to hear. Um, let me start with the immediate factors that people can notice help. Many people now switch to vegetarian diet because it's a healthier diet. If you think about the sort of antibiotics and the fact that 70% of the antibiotics that are made um, are actually being used in the animal in the industry for food um, because they keep them in such close quarters that they just couldn't survive if they didn't feed them on antibiotics. And I'm eating that food stuff. What is it doing to me? And so that's one little example. But of course, generally speaking, um, health and diet and plant-based diet is absolutely um, the right thing to have in terms of our own human growth and development. And then the second thing is the ecological aspect. And in terms of ecology, you know how much land space is required. You know how much water is required in terms of my um, question is um i'm sorry we're getting um some unmuting going on matthew sorry could you just yeah just check okay, that. thank so, you sorry sorry sister so, janty so the first is my own personal health the second is ecology and the need to to move to a plant-based diet so that we are releasing land space and water and so on for um everyone rather than just for a handful of people and then the other aspect is spiritual and if my food comes from non-violent sources then that's going to be enabling my mind to be more peaceful and so the spiritual side of it is where we take life um, for the sake of feeding ourselves and so um, do unto others what you would have them do unto you it's a golden rule in all traditions and generally for humanity to live with. And so if I'm killing for the sake of my own food, my own taste, basically, my mind is going to be a state of upheaval in which there's never going to be peace. And so if we want to have peace in the world, our sources of food have to be peaceful also. Yes, and of course, there's with what with factory factory farming um there's so much unnecessary unnecessary suffering in the animal food supply chain now um so that's Absolutely. really helpful um to to think about um because some people are faced with so so the people in the deep adaptation space generally anticipate a collapse of this way of life this way of life being the industrial consumer way of life where we have full supermarkets mm. um Mm. And and so some people respond to that by thinking they want to become more self sufficient and live closer to the land and and so there can be a reason for having some sort of chickens and such like pigs and so on in that. Other people say, well, because I feel that um, um, there's so much suffering ahead uh, that all my old stories of um, my what I believe in and who I am are crumbling. I just want to live as lovingly and kindly as possible and not contribute to any suffering of any sentient being as much as is possible. And so then they're more drawn to the, to the vegetarian uh, route. So it's, it's really interesting to see how people respond in different ways to this awareness Absolutely. of, of, mm. of, of a, a, an yeah. upheaval in our way of life uh, that's yeah. coming. And that's already and upon I, us, of course, in many cases, what with, what with the mm. coronavirus. Mm. And so I think that the more information we can share, people can make their own choices. Ultimately, it's each individual making choice, but the more information I have, the easier it is for me to make the choices that I feel comfortable with um, in a year's time, five years' time. So I'm going to come to Sasha in a moment, but I was wondering, before we go to questions from others, um, what's Brahma Kumari doing now in response to the uh, coronavirus pandemic? either where you are uh, or worldwide? Um, in India, of course, we have a huge community and we're able to look after many others in a physical way. And so, yes, we've got um, space given to the government for 
um, bringing people if they want to be put in quarantine or if they're patients, then we provided three buildings in our um, in one part of our campus where there's doctors and nurses who are there to be able mm. to care for people. So on that level, it's a very external help that we're providing. Um, on another level, wherever there are vulnerable people from within our community who are in quarantine or isolated or vulnerable, we're providing food for them and so forth. But I think the most important thing we're doing is helping uplift spirits and providing that sense of community that can come through Zoom, um, staying in contact with them, being able to reach out to them. And so I think every single center around the world now has, of course, um, our community classes where we come together has stopped um, a month ago, maybe six weeks ago. And so we've been engaging in all the online activities, right from meditations online, teaching online, our regular daily classes online, public events online. And the numbers we're getting is an indication that people are appreciating all of this greatly, mm. valuing it is a lot. That, the, is that can be found through brahmakumari.org, all the meditation yes, offerings. That's right. okay. yeah. And can people, yeah. can people make donations for your humanitarian work? through? through yes, their indeed. Okay. yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Super. Yeah. All right. Thank you, sister. So I'm going to hand over now to, uh, we're going to have a question from Sasha. If you could say where you are in the world as well, that would be interesting. Um, Matthew, if you could unmute Sasha, if or Sasha, unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, I live in the center of the United States in a rural area called the Ozarks. And uh, thank you. It feels so good to, to hear you talk today. W what I wanted to ask you is, you know, there's a lot, a lot of, of knowing how we want to be or how we should be, but that we're not achieving that. So for instance, wanting to have a more quiet mind, even when circumstances are tumultuous. And, but, but not meeting that ideal, then sometimes you know, I come into conflict with myself and it just seems to make things even worse, like the comparison of where you want to be to where you wish you were. And I wonder if you have any comments on working with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question, and I'm sure it's one that many others also have. Um, if I can develop my own inner power, then I'll be able to achieve the things that you shared. Um, and just me on my own might find it difficult, but if I can connect with the higher source, then I'm able to draw that power into myself, and dramatic changes can happen more than I believe is possible maybe at this moment. But yes, it can give me greater love, it can give me greater peace, it can give me an awareness of joy, and I'll be able to fill myself with that spiritual energy and power and start using it in my life. And so even a short practice of meditation every day can bring a huge amount of benefit. And of course, when we feel that something's bringing benefit, we want to increase it and enhance it. And so it becomes a natural incentive to continue with that. Like Jem was saying, that since practicing in a more regular way, there's been very visible results that have been experienced. Yes, at least I can claim that. I don't know if my partner would agree. <laughs> <There's> some... <laughs> oh, um, I've still got to keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> but also there's an aspect of self-acceptance, isn't there? That there's no, in, the, in a sense, that, that um, we'll never get this right. And that's okay. You know, just <laughs> keep, returning, keep returning to that, that, that effort and that state of love. Keep returning, falling away, and then keep returning back. It's in the Deep Adaptation Forum. We, don't, we, we have some principles for how we dialogue about these difficult issues of anticipating, preparing for transcending collapse. Um, but we don't just say that we're interested in compassion, curiosity, respect. We talk about returning to compassion, returning to curiosity, returning to respect, because it's, it's inevitable. These are stressful, stressful situations, stressful times. Some people say that humanity is having to have conversations that we've never had because individual civilizations have faced demise but this is a, the awareness we have of the threat to the whole of, 
whole of humanity at this time is quite a quite mm. unprecedented and so so of mm. course we're all going to get a little bit stressed and naughty with each other so it's that, it's that returning again and again it's good um, because uh, i like that because that is what it is it is there within us and so mm. we forget and so we have to remind ourselves and return to that yeah yeah, actually, remembrance, remembrance of our, our our soul's unity with the all is is obviously a very big thing in, in Sufism and lots of different different spiritual traditions. Mm -hmm. I quite like that. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going to go to Ono now. I don't know if I pronounced Ono's name right. Question: If you could say where you're from and unmute yourself. No, nope, you're still muted. There we go. I'm just, okay, I'm in New York. And um, my question is about the transformation that humanity will need to, you know, go through. And that is that we're much too wealthy. And that's this wealth is creating all of the problems that we're having. And I see it the only path forward is a much greater love. Is, is, is that, and so I'd like to, to hear about the connection between uh, spiritual fulfillment and being content and happy and satisfied with one's being and have that have the actual practical effect of um, reducing our wealth and also our carbon footprint. It's our wealth that makes this carbon, this massive carbon footprint possible. Thank and you. we need to go beyond. Thank you. And um, I, I would say that maybe it's a question of the imbalance of the distribution of wealth. And so there's a tiny, tiny proportion maybe 20% of the world that is wealthy and within that a 4% that is hugely wealthy, but 80% of the world isn't wealthy. And I'm not just talking about lacking in the spiritual wealth of love and joy, but actually physical survival. And um, okay, so some of the 80% might have some things some of the time, but not everything all the time. So you're talking about distribution and how inequality really rules the world at this moment. And so if I can take it on a very personal level first myself, and if I can learn to make that connection and allow my own love and joy and truth and purity to increase, what I can then do is to be able to be content and know that my happiness doesn't come from a bigger car or a better house or any of these external things. And that is a reality. Once you've got a certain amount of wealth to just maintain physical needs, then anything that comes beyond that, beyond that, beyond that, isn't adding to anyone's happiness. And there's a lot of research that's telling us this. And so, yes, I need a certain amount for my physical needs. But beyond that, what I need to do is to develop my own inner treasures and to know that my happiness is within. And on a very practical external level, it then means I can simplify. I just don't need all the external trappings that are available in materialistic societies today. And so I can simplify all of that and reduce my carbon footprint considerably by doing that. And there's more available for others to benefit from, to share. But I also become more free whilst I'm trapped by wanting and needing a lot of things externally. I'm trapped by those things. And I will feel very distressed and very unhappy if any of those things are missing in my life. If I've simplified my life and learned to have the happiness within that comes from that inner state of contentment, then I'll be able to manage my life in a much better way. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And uh, I found myself loosening my, um, loosening my habits of, of consumption. I think a lot of the consumption I was doing was just sort of out of, out of not being, you know, just normal life without thinking. And so that I think, uh, Definitely, I'm not going to go back to the same habits of consumption. I want to go to Katie Carr. She has a question for you, and then Sanel, and then we'll be coming up to the hour. 
So, um, uh, Katie, if you could unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Sister Janty. Um, yeah. My question uh, is that... Well, say where you from, are, by the way. Uh, I'm in Indonesia. I'm from the UK. Um, the spiritual path for me is just as much about being able to stay with, really, really live with the pain and devastation of what humanity is creating, continues to create, and not just having a way of returning to the love and the beauty, which is essential to being, to all, uh, every being. So how do we avoid spiritual bypass and consequently the, the risk of not addressing in our own lives and in the outside world, really, really tough decisions and actions? Um, as a spiritual, spiritually aware person, I'm very much here in the world. And so I'm not in denial of the world on any level. And I know that the world is going through a lot of pain and suffering, and I'm part of that world. And I've been through that pain and suffering. But what I've now done is to be able to look at myself from the inner perspective as a soul. And so if the body is unwell, I won't let myself go through suffering in a way that I used to before. But what I'll do is I'll say, okay, let me detach and let me give good vibrations to my body so that the healing process of the body takes over. And yes, I'll take the medication I need to take, but I'll use the power of my mind and the power of love and truth to go through my physical body so that I'm not suffering as I used to before. Otherwise, you know, we tend to wallow in self-pity. Woe is me. Why did this happen to me? And I wish it hadn't happened. And we're struggling with a fever. We're struggling with a cough, whatever it may be. But now I'm able to send vibrations of peace through my whole body. So I'm learning to deal with whatever is a suffering and pain in a different way. And when I see another person who's suffering, maybe I can say to them, okay, just for a moment, come back to that inner awareness of peace that you are and see if holding that awareness of peace can make you breathe more easily. And probably it would help them at that time. And so it's a very practical thing that meditation is teaching me. It's not a denial of the pain and suffering, but how do I deal with it differently? And so that I've given you just one simple example of what might happen with breathlessness or whatever. Um, somebody used this technique just a little while ago, and she said, I felt as if I wasn't going to be able to live because I couldn't breathe. And I remembered I'm a soul. And I could mm. feel my body relax. And I could send those vibrations of peace to my body. So there are different ways that we can learn about dealing with pain and suffering in different ways. I'm, I'm hearing a, a real, hmm, is it a paradox or is it a balance? It's, it's how do we um, tune into that? Uh, how do we develop equanimity, which isn't necessarily serenity. It's being able to be with whatever is without craving without wanting to always be peaceful and always to help everybody else be as peaceful as quickly as possible. Um, you know, to be, to be present to the suffering and present whatever suffering is happening in us as well, as well as in the world. Um, but not, it, not wallow in it, not be yeah. averse to it. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's some kind of stillness to be fully present rather than lost in our own cravings and aversions. And it, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Maybe it comes um, it really is. simply if you don't think. We just don't need to think. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I actually have had a brilliant master and teacher in Daddy because I saw her go through so many different illnesses. And so okay. it's, it's not that, you know, she was up above and uncaring. Um, she knew what is physical ill health. She'd gone through so many things herself another story for another time no i see but, so we just want to quickly end sorry uh, sister with sanel because we've got to finish now we've only got um sure. got, what three minutes before it comes up for a full hour so <laughs> okay. one one question sanel where in the world are you and what's your question I, for sister I, I mean, the final question before we close 
Yes, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for all your work, amazing. I'm here in Edinburgh, Scotland, and my question is to help my, my partner uh, who is listening to us. Um, so, um, how do you do when you don't have a habit of meditation, when you don't have experienced meditation in a developed way, yeah? But you all find yourself in a situation that is difficult. Uh, one month of isolation in your room, you've been caught by the virus, and not many hopes are there for you, but maybe meditation is one, although you don't have that experience, and it's difficult to, to embrace it, because, yeah, you don't know actually much mm -hmm. about it or how it works, and it's, yeah, your motivation gets lost over time. How do you do to, to get a little Thank bit you. more? into that thank you. Um, thank you a simple way to start on that inner journey is to read things that are uplifting and things that are inspirational for you and if you've got things like that share them with the ones you love so that then they can also read those things technology is amazing and there's yes the dark side of technology that i'm very aware of but the good side of technology is kicking in at the present time share beautiful thoughts inspirational thoughts and whoever reads these things then just takes a moment to just run them through the mind it's a beautiful idea and there you go you've started to meditate to allow your mind to reflect on things of beauty, of truth, of love and joy is meditation. Don't make it a mystery. Don't make it complicated. Just make it very simple. And so when you reflect on higher things, things of truth and joy, then you're moving in that direction, which is meditation. So share good things with each other. That's interesting to hear that. I was rather than just you know how to cross your legs on a cushion no <laughs> <laughs> no, no not at all <laughs> all right so brilliant um thank you very much for for joining us today sister jayanti and i hope that you're all um that you're safe and well over the coming weeks in in a difficult situation in india and uh um, and i have to say that your questions have been beautiful jen really very deeply spiritual it's an indication of your own returning to that love and truth in yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, I've, still, I've still got that wonderful don't think thing. Maybe I need more days <laughs> where I just keep don't it, think. It. And, um, it's difficult. It's a habit of a lifetime trying to be clever. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, try it in small doses. Um, yeah. After a few hours of overthinking, say, okay, stop. Stop thinking. Yes. All right. <laughs> Blessings and to everyone from around the world joining us. And um, uh, if, yeah, see you in a, in, in a month's time, those of you at the Deep Adaptation Forum for our next Q&A. And uh, thank you again, Sister Jayanti. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jim. Bye-bye.